Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the IRIS Mission Science Briefing. Here to talk about the IRIS Mission is Dr. Pete Warden, the Center Director from the NASA Ames Research Center. Jeffrey Newmark, the IRIS Program Scientist from NASA Headquarters in Washington. And Alan Title, the IRIS Principal Investigator from Lockheed Martin's Advanced Technology Center Solar and Astrophysics Laboratory. And we'll begin first with comments from the NASA Ames Center Director, Dr. Pete Warden. Uh, thank you, George. This is an incredibly exciting mission. Uh, I'll let Dr. Title tell you a little bit about the details of the science. But uh, from our perspective at NASA Ames, there's two really important points. The first one is that uh, this is a low-cost mission. It's a small explorer. Uh, and it demonstrates, the, I think, the wave of the future that we're going to be doing a lot more with lower cost, smaller missions. At the same time, getting really earth-shaking science uh, is, I think you'll hear, this is the first mission that will really tell us the, the detailed physics that's going on at the, at the uh, solar surface in the atmosphere above it. Uh, it's also a real opportunity to interact with uh, uh, computational work. Uh, NASA Ames uh, is the center at NASA that has the agency's supercomputer, and we are able to work the computer with the uh, data we have to really understand what's going on. In fact, that work's been going on for several years, so we're very excited about that. The second key point, though, is that the sun uh, is increasingly important to our environment. And as those of you that were listening a little earlier uh, saw the effect of power outages. Well, uh, we believe that some, maybe a lot of power outages, actually have a lot to do with solar activity. So the better we can understand the physics going on, the better we can understand that activity, the better that we could potentially uh, predict and mitigate some of these uh, problems. So it was sort of, uh, in some sense, unfortunate to delay the launch, but it's uh, also fortuitous to highlight the importance of this mission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warden. And now to Jeffrey Newmark, the IRIS program scientist from NASA headquarters. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be here today to I introduce the, the science of, of IRIS. Uh, IRIS is our uh, newest member of our heliophysics fleet. Uh, and, and I hope to, by the end of this press conference, you get an idea of the exciting science that we were doing uh, in, in heliophysics. Uh, I should step back and say, what is heliophysics? Heliophysics I is the oldest science known to man. It's the study of the sun, and it's also the newest science. It's the studying of its interaction with the Earth, our technology, uh, and the rest of the planets throughout the solar system. If you could show me the first video. Most people think of the sun as a constant source of heat and light that bathe our planet. This is how we see the sun, though, quite different than a constant source. You see here uh, images of the atmosphere of the sun, the outer atmosphere of the sun, and, and you see the tremendous amounts of of activity that is going on throughout these uh, video. I should point out that everyone, when we see these pictures today, people think of computer graphics. These are real images taken from our current spacecraft. These are, these are not generated. So all the movies I'll show you today are real images. Uh, what we're seeing here is the sun is, is a giant, huge nuclear fusion reactor. At the center, it is tens of millions of degrees. And over a half a million miles as it goes outward, to the surface of the sun, it slowly cools. And where the surface is about 10,000 degrees. Then something very strange and mysterious happens. In the next just a couple of thousand miles, the temperature rises again to the in the outer atmosphere to, again, millions of degrees. What causes this rise? How does the energy transfer from the surface, the, the cool surface, to this hot outer atmosphere? This is the questions uh, that Iris, the science of Iris, is going to address. Uh, one might ask, why do we care about the sun? What are we going to learn? What, haven't we seen a number of these graphics before uh, as we see these images? Can't we explain it from just this? And as I hope to show you that, no, we, there is more to be, to be gained. If you look at my second graphic,
you can show the second video. If we step back and we look at the sun now as the small in the center, and we see the larger uh, extended atmosphere of the sun, we see uh, a tremendous display, of, again, of activity. We see particles streaming away from the sun constantly. This is known as the solar wind. And then we see the solar storms. These were the ac active parts that we saw earlier on the sun. These are now expanding throughout the entire solar system. The snow-like features you see are actually high-energy particles streaming, hitting our spacecraft. Uh, and, and distributing the cameras. These high energy particles continue on, and less than an hour later, can hit the Earth. These, as, as uh, Dr. Warden mentioned, these can have effects for us on Earth. They can affect our navigation, our communications, our power systems, uh, and especially our astronauts once they leave the protective lower Earth's atmosphere. They'll be quite vulnerable, along with our other systems that leave the uh, protective low Earth. They become vulnerable to these storms that are traveling. So why, why heliophysics? What are we trying to study? So heliophysics is broken down then into fundamental questions. We're looking at what causes the sun to vary. What are the fundamental physics processes that are going on? How, do these, how does this variability in the interact with the Earth and all of the planetary systems? And what are the impacts on humanity and as we explore other worlds? So that is the science of heliophysics. I think by now it's obvious that we have a number of observatories to look at the sun. We've seen these beautiful images. Uh, if you could show my third graphic, the question then is why is a new one? Why are we launching IRIS? Um, IRIS actually fills a crucial gap. We've seen a lot of our current observatories look at the surface of the sun, the photosphere, for instance, where I just showed you in the sunspot. And then we have the full outer corona, the million degree corona that we see in the full disk. In between this interface region, which uh, you see in the inserts of some of these movies, we currently have uh, just some observatories now that look at the, without the necessary um, cadence the, and spatial resolution and spectroscopy to really unlock those mysteries of how the energy and matter flow What's driving the solar wind that uh, comes from there? All of that is hoped to be learned from IRIS. All right, and thank you. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Jeffrey. And now to Alan Title, the IRIS Principal Investigator. Alan? Thank you, George. Uh, you've heard so much about the sun, there's not very much left for me to say. Uh, <laughs> what is this interface region? Uh, and the answer is we don't know. If it's so important, why haven't we studied it in the past? Well, the, the answer to that was hinted at by Pete's comments, that this re the instruments that look at this region in the past have had about 20 times poorer resolution spatially and about 20 times poorer resolution spectrally. And spectrally allows us to measure temperatures, velocities, pressures, uh, so it's, it's important to have spectroscopic information. Uh, but basically, we've been looking at things that happen so fast that data taken as slowly as previous instruments have done really hasn't given us any information. But even more fundamentally, uh, there's not been a push to look at this region because the atomic physics in this region is very, very, very complicated. And it's only been in the last decade or so that people have developed computer codes that can do an, uh, what we hope is an accurate job of simulating these regions. And later in this talk, I'll show you some examples. But the Pleiades culture, computer cluster at Ames, has been instrumental in doing these simulations. Over the past three or four years, we've used about 30 million CPU hours a year at Ames, and a comparable amount on computers in Europe. So with the first slide, let's look where the interface region is. So what, what you can see in the center is a, a big yellow ball with little black dots on it. 
those little black dots are sunspots. And uh, surrounding it is the corona. And that was a picture taken on the 13th of November of 2012 in Cairns, Australia. So this was last year's solar eclipse. Uh, it was a particularly nice uh, view. And so the question that we're asking or hoping to answer is how we get from the bright yellow ball, which is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, to the atmosphere above it, which is a couple three million degrees Fahrenheit. So if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, we now see superimposed the top of the transition region. And that's where it fits. And you can see that it's not completely smooth around at the edges. And that's because there are a lot of three-dimensional structure that protrudes from the surface into the corona. And now we'll show you another movie. But let's hold the movie for a second and so I can tell you what this movie is. It's a series, of, it's a movie of the edge of the sun seen with the Hinode spacecraft, taken about as fast as Hinode can operate, which is about one image every four seconds. And what you'll see are a lot of little fine jets, hair-like structures on the edge of the sun. And on the top is the direct Hinode image. And on the bottom is an enhanced image. And you can see the fine central cores of these structures. These structures are about 100 miles wide and about 10,000 miles long. They go about 75 miles per second. Uh, and they last about 10 minutes. And we discovered these structures on Hino Day and realized for the first time that four second exposures and just one wavelength wasn't enough to see them. Also on the frame of this movie is an image of the Earth. And so if we could have this, my first movie. So on the top, you see these jets. And on the bottom, you can see these very fine central cores. And you can see some of them are as big as the Earth. So they traverse the diameter of the Earth in a time between 5 and 10 seconds. They're really fantastic things. They look like the smallest kinds of things that you see on the sun. But they're the size of the Los Angeles area going 75 miles a second, which is not quite as fast as you can drive on the freeways in Los Angeles. Uh, so if we could have the next movie, which shows the sun over a sunspot. And, and in this movie, if you look at the bottom, you can actually see the origins of the jets. And again, that's very fast, as is the movie is. Now what I'm going to do is show you what we hope we'll see something like. This is a numerical simulation. Uh, it's 3 million CPU hours. That means that if everybody in this room, let's assume there are 50 people in this room, uh, let's assume there are 30 people in this room, you all working on your computer for 10,000 years, you could make this movie. Or you could go to Ames and uh, run it in a few hours. Uh, actually, it takes several weeks because you don't get the computer all the time. Uh, so if we can have this movie, and this pans over the movie so you can see the three-dimensional structure of the atmosphere in this wavelength, which is on doubly ionized magnesium. Uh, so that is just the beginning. That movie is not what only thing you got for your uh, 3 million CPU hours. You got enough information to see what the spectrum would look like. So the next movie shows the first movie head on and moving the spectrograph slit across it and seeing how the spectrum changes. So we have that movie. And you can see the spectral changes are very complicated. Uh, the spectral line wiggles, it widens, the surroundings get bright and dark. And that all encodes the physics of the process that's going on. 
And without the interpretation that the computer provides from us, it would be difficult and pro probably impossible to decode this. So with that, I'll stop and uh, turn it back to George. All right. Thank you, Alan. And we're ready now for questions. And uh, once again, please give your name and affiliation when you get the mic. And we'll start here with Nora. Thank you. Uh, Nora Wallace, Santa Barbara News Press. Um, several of us have uh, newspapers that are not oriented towards science. And so I'd, I'm hoping that you can explain to our readers why this mission, mission matters to their lives and what IRIS will bring to the, to the average person in terms of knowledge. Uh, Pete hinted at it in the beginning, or maybe not hinted at it. Uh, my primary interest <coughs> right now is how we take the kinds of discoveries that NASA makes and communicates with society so that the society can interact with uh, what we learn as scientists. Because I'm well aware that all of these complicated details and uh, three million CPU hours of computer time doesn't really translate into something that's easily grasped. What, but what is easily grasped is the sun has massive explosions that put billions of tons of material moving tens of thousands of miles an hour into the Earth's atmosphere. They impact the Earth and they cause problems in a variety of ways. And many of these kinds of problems, as Pete mentioned, we are now learning are not gone. So you had a power system uh, go out in the San Inez Valley, and as a result of that, as a secondary effect, you had a bus bar uh, fail in a transformer at Ames. In the motel that I'm staying at, there was a, a fire truck uh, in front because when the power went out, somebody got stuck in an elevator. We live in a very, very complex society, and the sun has a very important role to play in it. So people like myself you know, look at what, what may be perceived as tiny details, but are in fact the engine that runs this system and the engine that fails sometimes. Perhaps I could add a little bit there. The, the field of heliospheric physics is often known as space weather. And it's, it, it's very similar to weather in many ways. And if you can think of a, a hurricane, for example, you know, the hurricane can have dramatic effects. Uh, the number of hurricanes may be related to climate changes and so forth. But in order to understand what's going on in that hurricane, you have to, to understand the detailed physics of it. So you have to understand how the heat comes off the ocean, uh, how it uh, interacts with the atmosphere, how the hurricane starts. Uh, in fact, there's an old statement that says that it, it was a butterfly wings flying, flapping in Africa that started the hurricane. And that's sort of what we're, we're, we're getting at here. The sun dominates everything in the solar system. Uh, it dominates our climate. It dominates our weather in many respects. So this is an important piece of understanding, if you will, that butterfly wing and how we can make those predictions that, uh, that in the end will help us understand, you know, power outages that we don't understand, understand changes to the Earth's climate, some of which are due uh, to influences the sun, some of them are due to perhaps human influences and a lot of different factors. So this is really ultimately about us and about how that object that we see in the sky every day affects it. Any further questions? Janine. Janine Scully, Santa Maria Times, Lompoc Record. You're talking about some cool science, but you guys don't seem too excited that you're, I guess, now two days away from launch. How excited are you to get this uh, mission underway so you can get this information? We're not excited. We're terrified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a mission like this starts five years ago. Hundreds of people have worked very hard. Uh, but in the end, we're f flying it on a device that's surprisingly reliable. But ultimately, it's in space. It's a difficult, 
complicated environment. Lots of things can go wrong. Uh, and it's a mistake ever to be too optimistic. You have to look at every downside. We've, we've just spent the last couple of days looking at all the way things can fail. Uh, so it puts you in a sort of mood that you know, you're not crossing your fingers, you're, you're really prepared, but you're also prepared for the fact that this is not something that just happens. This is something that's only the result of a lot of hard work. It'll be exciting when the door opens and we get science and we see that everything we've thought about really had, had come to roost and we get good data. But until then, you know, it's, it's more apprehension than science. I'd just like to add, not only, uh, I mean, I agree with Alan, and also, I think one of the most exciting parts is not answering the questions that, that we know. It's the new things, the discoveries that I'm, I'm positive Iris will, will bring us. Every time we've looked at the sun in more detail than we ever have before, it opens up a new window for us. And, and that's, I think that's the most exciting part, is, is the things that we don't know. Nora? Nora Wallace, Santa Barbara News Press. Um, when this information becomes available, is there any way to quantify for us um, the amount of data that you'll be receiving? Um, and also, who are the anticipated users beyond yourselves? OK. We know exactly how much data we get. Uh, and this, like all the other heliophysics experiments, are available to all in near real time, which means usually within a few hours and sometimes within a few minutes. But they're available to all the scientists in the world and, in fact, anybody who wants to use the data without any restriction whatsoever. And we have websites that you can log on to. You can learn how the experiment works. You can learn how to operate the experiment. You can even learn how to propose to do experiments on the experiment. <laughs> Additionally, uh, it, it, of course, there's the science data that, that the science community will be looking at. But there are, as Alan mentioned, the real-time movies, there's real-time data that, that, that normal citizens, everyone can look at. And in the movies that I showed and, and Alan showed, a lot of those are people look at them all the time. We, we have the statistics on the web that, that people are, are captivated by, by the beauty and the, the, uh, that this tremendous uh, star right near next to us uh, is what it's doing and so uh, this data certainly will be available uh, to all. Yeah and I, I might add one of the most important target audiences for this data of course it's the scientist uh, you know I'm a co-investigator on it and I can't wait to get my hands on it but it uh, this is really data that that will help us uh, get uh, the next generation of students and young people excited about uh, about the sun, of how it uh, it really dominates everything we do. Uh, so there's a, a very active program to make this data available to students, students uh, at every level. And so we're we're pretty excited about what we can do uh, with uh, with everyone. And and it, you know I it, it it you know if you have children, uh, we hope that they'll be bringing some of this home and showing you what they're thinking of. Any further questions? All right, uh, do we have uh, some from uh, Twitter or online? Hi, uh, questions from social media. Uh, the SDO AIA instrument uh, views the, the full disk of the sun. How much of the sun or what percentage of the, the sun will, will Iris look at? <laughs> just, just a few percent. Uh, it's, it has a very small field of view about 40 arc seconds uh, compared to 1920 that uh, AIA has. And the reason is that uh, we have higher resolution and higher cadence than AIA. And we don't have a geosynchronous orbit, which allows us Communi communicate 24-7 like AAIA has, and so we have to have an onboard memory and download our data uh, 
13 or 14 times a day to ground stations in the polar regions. Uh, so, but this is, it's an important, interesting experiment uh, that fills in a niche uh, between AIA and Hino Day. Okay, thank you. Uh, tell us again when that data will be available. We open the doors uh, 21 days after the 28th. Uh, and I imagine for a couple of weeks uh, we'll be doing all kinds of calibrations. But when we open the doors on AIA, uh, we saw one of the most spectacular events that we've seen in the entire mission, and that was broadcast all over everywhere. And if we see something spectacular on day one, it'll be all over the web too. Thank you. And back here, any further questions? All right, in that event, uh, just a programming note. Uh, there is no change to our NASA TV schedule on Thursday, the 27th. We will start uh, our live coverage of the uh, L-1011 departure at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time. That's 9 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll continue through spacecraft separation. And that will conclude our mission, mission science briefing as well as our pre-launch news conference. And thank you very much for coming.